Shotgun Quest, the social media sensation, the religious hippie. Life is a quest for logic and reason. It is a quest to find balance between science and faith. Life is a quest for knowledge and understanding. But most importantly, it's a quest for personal discovery. Whatever your quest, knowing yourself is the beginning of all wisdom. Welcome to Quest. Hello everyone, I'm your host, Todd Fisher, and this is Quest. For those of you that might be new listeners, let me tell you a little about me. I'm the founder of Metatomics and the author of the best-selling book, Metatomics, The Grand Design. I'm a philosopher, a theorist, a metaphysicist. I'm a perpetual pupil of theology, and I'm an expert in comparative religious study. I've also extensively researched the mind-body connection, anatomy, and physiology. I documented over 300 case studies while researching my book, all from a scientific perspective, with cases that ranged from near-death and out-of-body experiences to possession to past life experiences, as well as the metaphysical, the paranormal, and other unexplained cases of a spiritual nature. This podcast will bring you some of those astonishing stories, and in some cases by the people that actually lived them. From time to time, I'll be talking about important, perhaps even controversial issues from both spiritual and scientific points of view. The world we live in is ever-changing, and there's often a conflict between spirituality and science, and I wanted to bring you this podcast to balance that equation. It will show you how we know what we know, and there's still so much we don't know. For me, curiosity is part of what makes us human. It's the joy of discovery. It's what drives us. It's our quest. On today's quest, I have the religious hippie. She's built a pro-Christian social media movement with her witty and sometimes biting commentary. She is a voice for the new young generation of Catholics. I think you'll really like this interview. Hi, Rose. Welcome to Quest. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm excited to have you on the podcast today. So it's crazy because we've already been talking for like 45 minutes before we even started recording the podcast. We so had a lot we've of already had, yeah, we've already had a lot of cool stuff we're talking about. So now we're going to share some of that uh, with, with the listeners. But what I'm excited about is, so I found you on TikTok. I've had a few guests on my podcast that have come from TikTok, which is a huge movement, at least for the few more weeks that we'll have it, I guess. I don't know. If we're gonna have <laughs> Whenever TikTok. it gets banned. <laughs> going into the next month or not, but right now it's around. But, you know, so you have like, you have 89,000 followers on TikTok and 2.3 million likes <laughs> talking about Catholicism, which I never thought in a million years I would find someone young <laughs> <laughs> that would be talking about Catholicism that would get so many people that would be following it. Like, this is like, insane like you just don't see this on social media like congratulations on that for one thank you i'm honestly just as surprised as you are <laughs> <laughs> so i want to get so we're going to come back to tiktok but okay. let's kind of i want to back up for a minute so tell everyone a little about you you're so you're in illinois is that yes. right yeah how old are how old are you i'm 21. 21. um yeah how did you so how did you grow up did you grow up with religion or did your spirituality come on later so well, basically, um, my parents were raised Catholic, so I was cradle Catholic. Um, I was brought up in the church, the traditional Latin Mass, the Trinity Mass. Um, I was really into all of that. We also went to the Norvis Ordo every now and then, um, but the Trinity Mass was our home parish, and we loved going there. Um, I was confirmed when I was eight, obviously, or sorry, I was confirmed when I was 12, and I had my first Holy Communion when I was eight. Um, and I was baptized and all of that stuff. So really, I was brought up in a strong foundation. We always said grace before the meals. We always um, did Polish uh, 
kind of tradition around Christmas time and Lent. So I was raised in a very spiritually strong household. <laughs> yeah. And, you, and, this, and this stayed with you your entire life? Or did you, did you fall away from religion and then come back to it? Did, or tell me about that. Yeah. So unfortunately, I fell away because after confirmation, um, they don't really teach you much about your faith. I, I learned a lot about it when I was in First Holy Communion when I was a child and I understood it. Um, but then when I went through confirmation and I, I kind of, you know, I graduated, so to speak, from, you know, religious ed class, I, I, I didn't really know there was more to learn and because nobody ever told me. So I didn't know there was a catechism. I actually didn't know what that was until about a year and a half ago. <laughs> hmm. And um, so I fell away from the church for about eight years. Um, I still called myself Catholic, but only by name. I didn't really go to church. Um, I didn't really like talking about God. And half the time I kind of forgot he existed, um, and which wasn't good, but you know, I eventually came around. Um, but yeah, it, it was about like eight long years of depression and anxiety and just, you know, not knowing why I was here, not knowing my purpose for life, um, always feeling that call to be something better than uh, my sinful nature, but not really knowing how to approach it, um, almost being scared to approach it. Yeah. And uh, not until I hit rock bottom did I really decide like, okay, I need to change. I need to do something more for myself than it was for um, God at the time. But then it slowly started integrating and he started like chipping away at my heart and being like, okay, I'm coming, I'm coming in, <laughs> prepare yourself. Yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I ended up coming back to the church about a year and a half ago. Yeah. And best decision I ever made. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's great. So, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on the show is because of the, just the lack of youth I see out there that, uh, that are part of an organized religion. Um, and I, I find out there's a lot of youth that consider themselves spiritual, but they don't necessarily plug into organized religion. And I think part of that is simply the, the public relations nightmare that, the churches have and not you know, you know obviously with the catholic church it's been a series of what priest did the wrong thing to the wrong person but it's other you know it's other uh it's other forms of religion out there too it's it might be a minister that you had a an affair outside of his marriage or might have been there's always something scandalous that happens with people in right. power in organized religion and that's the stuff that makes the news right <laughs> And it's I think that scares people away. And I also think that there's a lot of parents that grew up with religion and they, they get married and they say, well, we're just not going to go to church again. And then their kids aren't raised with it. And right. then there's a confusion that happens. And then you get to be 18 or 19 years old and you're, you're searching and you're wondering and you're wondering what, why this was missing in your life when a friend of yours had this. And so I think that that's, that's an ongoing thing with people. Mm -hmm, but I, I find it interesting that you were able to, to, to grow up with it, lose it for a minute, get it back. And that's a very interesting, interesting way in which it happened for you. And, yeah. uh, and I'm wondering, you know, with young people considering themselves spiritual, but not necessarily plugging into organized religion, how can that change or should it change? What, what do you think about that? I think... To be honest, I think a lot of it comes from family. Uh, uh, if you think about it, a lot of people these days, unfortunately, have a very twisted idea of who God is. And um, basically, a lot of times people are taught that Jesus loves them. And uh, so when something goes wrong in their life, they're just like, Jesus doesn't love me anymore. Like, what's going on? They're never actually taught anything beyond Jesus loves you, so you should have faith in him. And yeah. I think that's why it's so important for parents to really take their children's life seriously, you know, when it comes to the spiritual side of things. Because children are pure. They're the purest forms on earth, um, you know, until, of course, they're of the age of um, understanding and, you know, stuff like that. And sure. so you can impact them in a good way or a bad way as a parent. 
And so it can go either way. It's either you are, you know, a Christian family and you live the values of a good Catholic Christian life or, you know, anything like that. And that rubs off on your kids. And, you know, then when your kids become, you know, old enough to decide if they want to pursue Christ or if, you know, they don't, that's their decision. But at least you raise them with the morals of understanding who Christ actually was and that he does love you, but he's also just. And so there's that whole thing. But then there's another side of it where you could have been raised in a corrupt Christian family who claimed to be Christian, but didn't actually uphold any of the Christian values. So now you have a warped idea of what Christianity is and don't want anything to do with it. Um, yeah. So I think it can go towards that. I think it can go towards the fact that nowadays everybody is being told, do what makes you feel good. Whatever makes you feel good is what you should be doing. If something makes you feel bad, don't do it. And that's not really a part of Christianity. Part of Christianity is suffering, unfortunately, but at the same time, it, it grows in our virtue of humility and it makes us closer to God. So there's that whole thing where society's telling you, do what makes you feel good. Doesn't matter, you know, you make your own rules for yourself. Like morality is up to the individual person. And so kids really feed into that because they want to be con in control of themselves, you know? Um, especially nowadays where, you know, there's so much corruption in the world. It's unfortunate. And I think a lot of it has to really do with family, you know, um, what the kids are brought you, up in and raised in. You know, you mentioned something a little earlier. Um, you, we just talked about people <clears throat> potentially losing faith when things don't go, don't go right. I want right. to kind of talk about kind of the current world we're living in right now. So with COVID, yeah. It's really, the world has really changed this year. Like this has been the craziest year in a really long time. Like, and uh, some might say this is a biblical plague, <laughs> you know, right. so it's very, but you know, what COVID has done is kind of cripple our economy and cripple our infrastructure and people are at home and there are many people that are alone and people have anxiety and they have depression. People are losing their jobs People can't go places, meet with people. You can't even have the most fundamental, like you can't even sit with someone on a park bench without, you know, six foot distance, a mask and worried you might lose your life. Like right. the world is so tilted now. And I often wonder like, do in, in events like this, like what we're experiencing um, kind of with this collective shared experience, is this bringing people to religion more now or is this or are people losing their faith because they've lost their job and they're about to get evicted and you know they've been praying and things just get worse where do you think people are at during a time like this i think it's interesting because it can go either way i feel like in one sense you know i think covid has really given us a understanding of how important mass is and what a privilege it is that we can actually go and attend mass, you know, um, and receive the sacraments and everything like that. I think that's so important. But then there is that other side where uh, people will blame God for basically everything um, that goes wrong in their life. And I think in that instance, um, I really haven't seen too much of that, uh, shockingly, because I mean, there are people who don't return to church because of COVID and they don't want to catch it and understandably, but there's that side of it where it's like somebody lost their job or something like that and they go to church. Like they continue going to church because they are renewed in that faith because they put all their faith in God that he will take care of them. And plus with so many people being afraid to die, they feel like they really have to make things right with God. And so right. it's actually been bringing them back to the church rather than keeping them away per se. Yeah. Um, so I think that it could go like two drastically different ways, but I've been seeing it go the latter, you know, where people are more like, I could possibly die, you know, and I don't know what happens after death. So I'm going to make things right with God or, you know, learn about God or religion. So. Right. Right. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting to see how people have approached faith during this and yes. uh, how many people, you know, I know that spiritual books, religious books are selling like more than they've ever sold. <laughs> like, oh, it's crazy. It's, so, I mean, that speaks volumes right there. 
that people yeah. are wanting to get in touch with something. And, uh, and I think that, that says a lot. One of the things, I want to touch on this for a second. One of the things that irritated me a lot um, during COVID was churches being shut down. I have a, I want to know how you feel about this because they say, you know, essential services is the, th is the term, right? And state to state, yeah. essential services that could stay open, you know, they were, there was a designation of what those would be. And churches did not fall under essential services. Do you think it was right to shutter churches during this? No, I do not think it was right at all. Uh, churches should be available to everyone. Um, I know for a fact that back in 2016, I'm not sure if they still do this, but my parish would, ha would be open from five in the morning until like 12 at night or 12 yeah. in the morning, like from five in the morning to 12 in the morning. Um, and the reason they did that was because the church needs to be open to everybody. Like basically it's exactly as if you put out a sign saying you're open. You know, if you're open, you're going to get customers. People are going to come in. They're going to want the sacrament. They're going to want, uh, you know, they're going to want a confession and stuff. And so as long as you keep the doors open, people will come. And they, they've seen hundreds of people, you know, come in to receive the sacraments and confession. And I also think it's really important to note that, you know, the saints, they risked their lives and many of them lost their lives to go to mass and confession or, or to receive, you know, the Eucharist and all of that. They died, you know, living out God's, you know, purpose for us, like going to mass, spending time with him, receiving the Eucharist, going to confession, like they put their life on the line to do so. And, um, understandably, if you don't want to, like, that's, <laughs> that's different. <laughs> But I do believe that like there's that whole other side of it where like these holy people risk their lives for God, you know? Yeah. I, I agree with everything you just said. <laughs> <laughs> I, awesome. think, I, I think, I think church was an essential service and I, you know, it was crazy to me to watch, to, to just see news coverage of police blocking parking lots and ticketing yes. people for wanting to go to church. It was like, what country am I living in right now? Like, this is the most insane thing that I've ever seen. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, you know, I think, I think for the safety of people, there could be some modifications and rules to keep people safer in church or have expanded hours. So things don't have to be so congested or packed in a church that does have busy services. You know, there could have been some protocols there, um, in place, but I don't think they should have been shut down. And also, uh, thing, things that a lot of people don't think about are the other uh, services that churches provide in terms of feeding the homeless. They'll provide uh, rooms for Alcoholics Anonymous right. groups to come. Like when things started getting shut down, and if you were if you were a drunk, you didn't even have a place to go. Like some of these, some people rely on these meetings so they don't fall back into habits of drinking or doing drugs. And that wasn't even available. Right. And it's just, it, all these things, it's kind of a domino effect of these good and decent services that can not now not mention. be provided because right. the state says, oh, it's not essential. Yeah, it's not, not to mention, it's like, not like, there's that whole aspect of it. And people really rely on the church, you know, and not to mention the whole, um, like, uh, anointing of the sick. People couldn't even do that. People yeah. died without being allowed, allowed is the key word, to receive anointing of the sick. Allowed. Yes. Like, yes. You know, I, I had not funerals. thought about that. Yeah, I did. I, I knew, you know, the funeral part, obviously, that had occurred to me, but I didn't think about last rites and, and yeah. things like, like, I didn't, it didn't even occur to me that, you, chaplains probably weren't even allowed in hospitals at a certain point. Or, or even nursing priest. homes. Yeah. Yeah. I know a lot of people that just couldn't spend the final days with their family members. And yeah, yeah that's it's uh, like the amount of like loneliness and, and then almost that feeling of abandonment because from the church itself, because they wouldn't allow you to receive the sacraments because of a virus. And it's just like, it, it totally breaks my heart that some of these so elderly people who were faithful Catholics died without receiving their last rites and anything because the, the state said it was, you know, not allowed. Like you can't, you don't get to decide who receives sacraments and who doesn't, you know, you don't have that authority. 
Right. Like right. you cannot deny anyone the Eucharist, you know, well, uh, you know, like, you know, you know what I mean? You can't yeah. deny that from a faithful Catholic who's dying and yet they did. And that breaks my heart. Can yeah. you imagine? Uh, unbelievable. Like, yeah, I can't, I can't imagine. Like it would have been a terrible, 2020 was a terrible year to be dying. <laughs> yeah. Very the, true. the, uh, I want to circle back to something that yeah. I want to touch on. So, yeah, I think one of the things we were talking about, you know, youth getting involved in religion, but just a generalization of anyone of any age who wants to, to plug into religion. How does one start the process of joining organized religion? And the reason why I want to just kind of touch on this a little bit more, I think a lot of people are confused about how to start because they right. feel like if they just go to any whatever church on a Sunday that they're going to step into the middle of something they won't understand. Like I've missed the beginning. I don't know where we're at in this. People think of the Bible as a book that you right. read from beginning to end. But when you go to church on Sunday, you might not be coming in at a particular starting point in that. And I think a lot of people, and then this seems really odd, kind of odd and maybe even trivial to say, but, but do, you're not going to go to church and start at the beginning. You're going to right. come in somewhere in the middle. And I think this is, this hurts people. How do people get into organized religion? How do you learn the base? How do you go to church on Sunday and learn the basics? I think, well, from a Catholic's perspective, because that's what I am and I don't really speak for any other religion, but yeah, no, I totally know, from yours. Let's do it. Yeah. yeah. From my perspective, something that, um, a priest told me was, I told him, I'm like, I'm having issues understanding the mass. I don't understand certain things. I don't really know what he's doing here. I'm not understanding the prayers or where we're at in the Bible. And he told me, he's like, get a red book. And a red book is basically a missile so that you can follow along with the mass. And it's, I go to the traditional, um, the Latin right mass. So it's in Latin and I'm taking a Latin class actually in September. Oh, it is September. I'm taking a Latin class this week. Um, but yeah, Basically, it's really important that we first understand the service, um, the mass, and like the understanding of like what's going on, the prayers, and all of that. I think the best way to really start is, from a Catholic perspective, look up um, look up where you're at in the liturgical calendar. Look up what the the readings for that day are going to be for where you're going to go you know, in the Bible. So then that way you can prepare ahead of time and actually understand what's going on. Um, yeah. It's all about really being prepared for ahead of time. That's what yeah. it is. Like research, knowledge, education is super important. Yeah. And I always suggest, uh, you know, A, reading the gospel and the readings for that day before going so that you can, you can understand them better. And even, um, even doing like, um, kind of, I don't really know what to call it, but basically you go to a priest and you ask them specifically for certain information on that day's mass, you know, or their homily sure. and stuff. I'm not exactly sure if there's a specific. And, and the liturgical calendar for people that aren't familiar with that, with the Catholic church, whether you're going to a Catholic church in Illinois or Kentucky or New York or Hawaii everyone is teaching the same thing on that particular Sunday. That's correct, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, yes. Versus other Christian denominations where you will come in and, you know, that minister, that preacher are going to teach whatever they want. There's no right. real consistency among what's being taught. The Catholics are teaching the same thing in every church on Absolutely. that particular Sunday. Yes. Based on the liturgical calendar. I just wanted to be clear yeah, that, if I was right. <laughs> no, that. Yeah, that is that is right. Yeah, because we're called the universal church. And so no matter where we go or what we do, we want everyone to be on the same page. And that's why uh, Latin was so important, because it was a language that almost anyone could learn and understand easily. Um, right. It was way more simpler than English to start. And because English is basically just like seven languages in a trench coat. <laughs> and it's basically easier for people who, I mean, most people can speak Spanish, which is amazing. I think that's awesome. But it's more of like that universal language that almost everybody knows in a sense. A, a lot of people consider it a dead language in America nowadays, 
yeah. but it's, I don't know, it, it, it kind of just, it helps, you know, and being a universal church, we need to be able to cater to everybody in the world. Right. Right. And we can all be on the same page by using that liturgical calendar. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Let's, um, let's talk about your TikTok world. This uh, yeah. is all really cool to me. So, so you are the religious hippie. Yes. This is your TikTok movement. And this has become huge. Why do you think it picked up like it did? Oof, that is a great question. Um, I think, I think in all honesty, a lot of people my age were seeking truth. Um, I do have like a lot of different people follow me. Uh, Muslims follow me, Protestants follow me, bunch of different people, all different ages, all different, you know, uh, uh, races, everything. And they all tend to have one thing in common. They want to learn. Um, they want to learn more. They like the fact that I'm basically the younger generation's age. So it, it caters to the older people because they can understand how to cater to the younger people. You know, what we want, what we want out of mass, what we want out of the sacraments and things like that and how we're viewing the world because they grew up in a completely different world than we are. Um, so that helps them to understand the world that my generation's living in. And then for my generation, they're really wanting the truth and they really want to grow in their faith and seeing somebody who's their age, you know, I'm 21, but I, you know, from 16 to, you know, 25, I fit that age range, basically, they see that you can go against society, like, and that's what we're meant to do as Catholics, we're supposed to, you know, deny society's sinful, you know, fallen nature, and follow Christ. And I think it's very difficult nowadays because people my age, especially on social media and everything, they don't see it as much as they see the fallen nature of society. Society tells you, do whatever makes you happy, do whatever you want, sin, do this, do that, do what makes you happy. And in reality, it's like we are really called to, you know, pick up our cross and suffer and stuff through this world. And I think a lot of people my age were scared to do so because it was going against society. It's basically going against everything they they knew or was raised in. Um, and because they don't really see, you know, devout Catholics their age, they see all these billboards, you know, of inappropriate stuff all the time, or it's always pushed in their face on, you know, YouTube and stuff about, you know, um, the whole BLM and, you know, homosexuality and everything. And I think, they're scared, you know, to really say what they think and say what, you know, who they follow. In all honesty, I think it took off mainly because they wanted truth. They yeah. wanted to know, they wanted it straight and they wanted something that was going to feed their soul and they just weren't sure how to do it. And so seeing someone who well, I'm still struggling, but <laughs> seeing someone who kind of picked her life up and started pushing for what was right, you know, pro-life, you know, pro-God, sacraments, traditional family values, you know, and everything. They're like, I want that. That's what's feeding my soul. And I want to know how to do that. And so they've been following me because I'm on this own journey and they're kind of following me and seeing how I do it. And I'm trying to make it so that when I make a mistake, they don't, and I, I warn them about it, you know? Um, yeah. But yeah, I guess that's basically it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I love that. I love that. Do you also get haters being a vocal supporter of religion? Oh, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's pretty bad, to be honest. I, um, it's, not as, it's not as frequent as it used to be. Um, but yeah, I would definitely get a lot of R-rated... <laughs> Uh, hate messages and what, what would what would people say to you is it just you know you're worshiping mickey mouse it's all a bunch of hooey i mean what, like what kind of things would people oh, I say wish. To you? <laughs> i wish it was that pg um a lot of times i i would get rape threats uh really was, wow yeah that was the biggest one um the one that came after that would always be you know, disrespecting our lady in some way, saying that she should have gotten an abortion, you know, or something like that. Um, 
yeah, it can get really dark. And I think the worst, the worst one would be, I don't know. I always say there's like, there's so many, but I think the worst one would go ahead. Do you, do you block these people or do you let them still see what you post and keep, keep putting it in their face? How do you, how do you? Yeah, I tend to, well, obviously it's my motto. The haters will be prayed for. That's basically in all my social media. Yeah. But so obviously I pray for them, but it depends. It depends on how bad it is. If it's like super bad where it's just like they're spamming and it's like inappropriate and stuff like that. I, I usually, um, I do block them, but if it's more like they're just being disrespectful in the sense of like you worship Mary kind of thing, I usually just restrict them. Like they can still view my stuff, but I have to approve any comments that they put on my posts mainly because I still feel like even though I can't get through to them by talking to them in the DMs or anything, I still have a evangelization uh, opportunity by, yeah. you know, still sharing with them, you know, my faith and stuff that we believe. So it depends. If it's super, super bad, I will block them because sometimes people are just relentless and that's unfortunate and it's sad. But in, at the end of the day, if, if they're just being ignorant, you know, ignorance, Um, I usually just restrict them, make sure that they're not posting anything inappropriate on my pages or anything like that. But I still want them to see it because that's how I feel like a lot of people learn these days is through seeing pictures on social media and stuff. And yeah, I just, I think it's, it works, you know? Yeah. Do you, do you find it hard to date being a religious person or does it scare people off? So I'm dating my boyfriend currently and he, Mm -hmm. he's a Protestant, but He's very open to my faith and he's very supportive of it. Um, but previously, yeah, honestly, I, it, it was interesting. People, when I was younger, when I was in my teens, I didn't actually realize all the misconceptions that people had surrounding Catholicism. I thought everybody knew what I knew growing up and I thought everybody understood and respected me. Unfortunately, that was not the case. (laughs) And learning at a very young age, about 14, I realized that if I, well, at that time, you know, being in a secular world and stuff that I kind of put in my brain that like, if I ever wanted a boyfriend or anything, I would have to hide the fact that I was Catholic. And uh, so I started kind of using the blanket term Christian. And I, 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 like, if people ask specifically what I was like, oh, what denomination of Christian, I'd say Catholic. But normally people wouldn't pry that far. Um. And so, yeah, I, I was really kind of almost off put that at that time that my religion would almost uh, comp- like comprehend my potential, you know, boyfriends, <laughs> you know, like I, sure. I would, you know, I wouldn't have as many options and stuff. Now, obviously I see that as a blessing, but um, yeah, it, it did actually quite a bit. And I think that was a good thing because in the Bible, it does say we should be equally yoked with our spouse. And it just, it really helps to, you know, alleviate any type of religious tension, because like you said, there are three types of, you know, main points that get people to boil and religious, like religion's one of them. And I know a lot of, you know, marriages that have broken up due to religious indifferences, unfortunately. So yeah it's just really important to get on that same page and really understand that marriage is a three person thing. It's God, it's you and your husband or wife, you know? Yeah. You know, you mentioned, uh, so you mentioned a couple of things I want to kind of touch on. So you talked about, you know, labeling yourself as a Christian. It's at one point versus calling yourself a Catholic. And then you mentioned, uh, Mary a little bit earlier. Yeah. What do you think the biggest misconception is about Catholicism? I know, I know what you're going to say because I've seen it posted on your TikTok a million times, but I want you to say, tell my listeners, what do you think the biggest mis- misconception is about Catholicism? The biggest misconception is that they believe that we worship Mary and the saints or statues <laughs> yeah. in general. Yeah. Yeah. I or, think that, it's very, or that it's very, not Christian. <laughs> exactly. Yes, yeah. that is also a bigger, big one as well. I think the biggest thing is that people don't understand uh, the definition of words. Uh, prayer is not the same thing as worship. 
and um, hail is just, you know, people would say hail Caesar. They weren't worshiping Caesar. In China, they bow to each other as a sign of, um, you know, recognition or just, you know, acknowledgement. And it's not worshiping. And I think a lot of people don't understand that worshiping involves intention. Um, in order to worship something, you have to intend to worship it. And, you know, we don't, in, I mean, I know there are some weird Catholics out there that, <laughs> that have said they worship Mary, but at the same time, I'm like, mm, no, that's not right. That's heresy. Um, but, you know, there's yeah. that side of it where it's just like, I don't think people understand the actual definitions and yeah. they're kind of just taught these definitions through maybe their own research or maybe it was through a parent or a pastor or something. So it's very interesting to me that um, people don't understand that prayer and worship are not the same thing. It's interesting to me from a pop culture perspective, yes. the kind of the, the, the pomp and circumstance, the beauty of the Catholic church and, and everything that's gone into it. It's what you, that's what you see evolve into movies. When a church is depicted, it's always something that's beautiful and ornament. It's definitely a Catholic church, you know, and yes. you see the rosary and you see, you see so many things that are of a Catholic nature depicted in pop culture. And you have, you have people out there that will wear the rosary as jewelry and not really understand its purpose. But yet you yeah. have Christians that will, will knock those things. And I just wonder if it's just because of a lack of understanding about it. The rosary is so symbolic of Christianity. All, obviously, it's uniquely Catholic, but it's right. also something that's that's kind of something you associate. I think the normal person, nine out of 10 people on the street would just consider the rosary part of Christianity and not necessarily know where it fit anywhere. But right. it's just even things like that. It's just really interesting to me that it's almost the stupidity of people that they just don't get it, you know? Yeah, no, yeah. Like they say, ignorance is bliss. Unfortunately, there's two types of ignorance. There's the ignorance <laughs> where you choose to stay ignorant, even though there's information available. And then there's the other one who just doesn't actually um, but as for the rosary, yeah, it actually dates back to the first century um, because the monks would meditate on Jesus's life through praying on basically a cord and beads. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually, you know, they would recite the, I think it was the 150 Psalms. And um, eventually they realized that they wanted the laymen to have their own prayer, but most laymen were actually illiterate. So they couldn't actually understand or pray any of the Psalms because that would take too too long to teach them and so they needed an easy prayer and that's where the our father came from um a lot of times people thought that saint dominic instituted the rosary but it be it was it was already in institution when uh before he was even alive and it was considering and it was continuing to evolve even after his death even though he was a really important part of it um a lot of it predated and postdated him so that's interesting but yeah it's just it's just interesting to me how all of this, all of this can instantly be researched. Google, like we literally have the world at our fingertips on Google. Any information we could possibly want, as long as it's truthful and it's not biased and it's not, you know, incorrect. Because <laughs> yeah. there are websites like that out there. If you're going to research Catholicism, go to the Catholic Catechism or a Catholic site. Um, because there are going to be biased things out there. You wouldn't go to Judaism if you're going to research, you know, uh, I don't know, Protestantism. So don't do vice versa. <laughs> but right. it's just interesting to me um, how all of this, all this information I've ever gained in the last year and a half, I learned through research. I learned through analyzing things, through documents, through the church documents. I analyzed everything. I understood where they came from to create the Bible, you know, com not create, compile the Bible, um, you know, and, and all of that. And so it's just interesting to me how we literally have all this information to research and yet nobody uses it. Almost nobody uses it. And I, I just, it blows my mind sometimes that I'm just like, Somebody could say, you know, the most, you know, ir you know, ir irradical thing, you know, they're just like, oh, you worship Mary and the saints. I'm like, well, actually, if you read the Catechism of the Catholic Church, you would see that it actually condemns, 
you know, the idolization of anyone besides God. So you can't really blame us for something the church doesn't actually teach or believe in. That's kind of just your own idea. You know what I mean? Yeah. Kind of? so it, it, the, and the interesting thing about <clears throat> in, in uh, religious history, in a way, Mary is very important. And, um, yeah. and, and even in Islam, the, yeah. she is the only woman named in the Quran and they've referred to her 70 times and they explicitly identify Mary as the greatest of all women. And they talk about, um, you know, talk about her being the mother of Jesus. And, and it's, it's, uh, it's interesting to me how that can be diluted in so many other places oh, when exactly. some might, some might even consider a rival, some that a rival religion will refer to the same person but within the bulk of Christianity, people will, will break that down. Like, it's just interesting to me. <laughs> it's, very, it's very interesting, not to mention, like, a lot of the, um, the creators of Protestantism, such as Martin Luther, they believed in the veneration of Our Lady, and he was very much so devoted to her. So it was very interesting to me to see how it's basically evolved into this anti-Mary kind of religion almost it's very it's very sad because what's the worst insult anyone could give you it's not going to be about you it's going to be about your mom like, exactly the worst insult you could ever insult anyone is by insulting their mother and what are you doing you're insulting jesus's mother she breastfed him she taught him how to walk she taught him how to read and write and joseph taught him how to do carpentry he loved and he respected and he just in general he obeyed his parents equally you know yeah. both his father in heaven you know joseph and mary he loved them all equally and it's really sad that people don't understand that you know it, it's sad does having a spiritual life automatically make you conservative do you have conservative values I do. Yes, I am very much so a conservative. Um, I think in a sense, it comes down to our worldview. And if we truly are, you know, understanding in our faith and um, what God is, you know, teaching us and stuff through his word and through, you know, the oral traditions of the apostles and Jesus, I think debatably, um, yes, I do believe so. Mainly right now, because of the fact that um, right now we have the most pro-life president ever who actually had nuns talk about the rosary on his show and played Ave Maria after his convention. Like, you don't see the Democrats doing that, unfortunately. And I think we really have to go where our, uh, where we are respected as Catholics, you know, where our views and our faith is respected. And Unfortunately, we're not getting any respect from Democrats, and they are actually okay with the riots that are happening, with the beheading of the statues and the spray paint and the vandalization. They haven't spoken out about it at all, whereas Trump has actually put in an executive order to protect Catholics and their churches and actually criminalize anyone who vandalizes or, you know, defaces any of our uh, statues, you know, or churches. Do you think that people that are violent during protests or, or graffitiing things, destroying property. Do you think any of these people could potentially be spiritual or religious and just creating a, you know, just exercising the right of freedom of speech? So unfortunately I'm going to bring in World War II to this. <laughs> sure. So in World War II, that's kind of when atheist, atheism um, sprouted. And um, that's when, if you look at World War II, they started burning books. They started getting rid of religion. They started tearing down bell towers and burning churches. What's happening now? The exact mm. same thing. We don't have, sure, the Nazis aren't no longer the Nazis. They might go by a different name now. And that's unfortunate. And there's different, there's different issues, but eugenics is still a thing. Look at abortion. That's eugenics. And who supports abortion? The Democrats. Unfortunately, and all of this comes from an atheistic standpoint. You can be atheist and pro-life. I'm not saying you, there's, you know, discrimination there. There are some people who are atheist or, you know, consider themselves non-spiritual and are still pro-life. However, 
when we have that Christian worldview, we view life as a gift from God. We view all these things, you know, the breath we have, the eyelashes, you know, individual hairs on our head as a gift from God. And naturally, I don't believe that people who are Christian or Catholic are violent per se, because I mean, there's righteous anger. We seen, you know, Jesus permit that when people were disrespecting the temple and he had a corded whip and basically got everyone out of there because they were disrespecting his father's house. Um, so there's righteous anger. However, um, I don't know. I, I really do think that in an extent, this is part of um, an atheistic comeback, an anti-God um, America, and it's very sad, which is why I'm so thankful to Trump for bringing in God back in to um, America. Let's talk about some hot button topics. You're, Let's go. You, you lean a little conservative. I want to do a series of just quick questions, and these can be as simple as yes or no's. Got it. Abortion. Uh, I'm pro-life. <laughs> okay. Alcohol and marijuana. Um, I don't know. I, I struggle with the marijuana one because I have friends that use it for medical purposes because they're in pain and it does help yep. them. But if they're using it as just like a drug to get high or something, no way. And alcoholism, I enjoy a drink in moderation, as did Jesus and a lot of other people back in the day. But anything in moderation is good. But if you take it out of that moderation, it can be turned into a sin. So okay. double, double. Pornography. No, it needs to be banned. What about premarital sex? Uh, also n a big no, no. It creates uh, broken families. And unfortunately, that is a big issue of America today is a broken family. The death penalty. I am pro-life. Um, the church teaches a little bit about that, but I'm pro-life still. Under God in the Pledge of Allegiance. Needs to stay in the Pledge of Allegiance because our life is in God's hands. Gotcha. Women in the priesthood. Nope. <laughs> it's, it's reserved for men only. <laughs> yeah. I was interested. It's, I don't have very many. I just wanted to hit on a couple of those to no, see yeah. how you felt about those yeah, because yeah. it's interesting. It's interesting to hear, to hear a young person's perspective on these things. I was really, I kind of have guessed what maybe you were going to say about some of these, but some I was wondering about. Marijuana is becoming legal everywhere. Like we can't yeah. stop it. And uh and, you know, I think there, there is some science to support. Um, there is some science to support that th there are some qualities about it that could be good for you. There's also some science to support it could be a gateway drug to worse things. <laughs> exactly. So it's I really kind of, kind of crazy. No, no yeah. it's a, and then death penalty. I wasn't sure where you were going to fall on that one. Yeah, it was a tricky one because for me, um, there's a lot of issues going on right now with that whole, you know, the, the um, sex trafficking and stuff that's going on right now. And a lot of, you know, uh, sexual predators are put on the death penalty. And for the longest time, being a young girl who was actually, in a sense, sexually abused at a young age, I was just like, yeah, they deserve death because blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, we have to understand that God, God is the final judgment. He, he, invokes the last judgment and um basically they can rot in jail for however long but it, i don't i still don't think in a sense it's our place to be taking somebody's life because or you know invoking that death judgment because at the end of the day god is the final judgment yeah and I think that's just kind of something that opened my eyes a little bit when uh, I came back into the church. And the catechism talks about it, too. I'm not exactly sure where, but it yeah. talks about it. Let's talk about some of your practice. <clears throat> How often do you go to church? Every Sunday, Holy Day of Obligation, and every first Saturday of the month. How often do you pray? I do the daily rosary, and also I do devotions to Our Lady of Sorrows. Gotcha. So every day. <laughs> Okay. And that was my next question was the rosary. So I figured that was probably a, a daily practice for you. Yeah. So in that, in, that's not an unreasonable thing to do. That's not a lot of time out of your day to give to God. And yeah. I don't think people should 
ever feel like religion will be a burden to them. And I, I think today you've made it, you, you'll make people feel good about wanting to seek out religion or to uh -huh. refine their spirituality into, to, into something more. <clears throat> and, uh, and they can see how you live it, you know? Right. No, absolutely. I think the biggest thing is to understand that, you know, God doesn't ask us, you know, to spend 24 hours with him. Most of the time, he just asks us to spend a half hour with him. And I think the most important thing we can do is just pray daily. Like you can do little prayers throughout the day. It doesn't have to be in one big chunk. For me specifically, I pray the rosary at night. I do devotions during the middle of the day. And then I kind of have my morning prayers, like the St. Michael prayer and, um, you know, those types of prayers, like before I get out of bed, just a prayer of thanks. Um, but it's really doesn't take a lot, you know, um, God will give us, you know, the graces to become closer to him. And all we really have to do is ask and put in that effort to really become closer to him. Yeah. Yeah. How can people find you out there on the interwebs? Do you have a .com? Where are you at on social media? Tell everyone how to find you. So I'm basically on almost every social media. I'm on Twitter as The Religious Hippie. I have a YouTube channel, The Religious Hippie, and TikTok. I'm also on Facebook. And um, honestly, just type in The Religious Hippie. You'll find me there. I have Snapchat as well. And those are going to be linked on my YouTube channels um, just because it's kind of a long little name there. So I'm not going to say it. But sure. yeah, but um, basically YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and uh, TikTok. Those are the five social media platforms I'm on. You're all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> Got to cater to everybody. Yeah, exactly. Because some people just like to use one of those things, you know? Exactly. Mm -hmm. As we close out the podcast today, do you have a favorite passage? Oh, I have so many. Honestly, I do. And I actually have it highlighted in my Bible. And I'm so excited. And this is... It. There you are. So this is, there we go. So this is basically the Beatitudes and it's, uh, it's Matthew five. And he says, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who mourn for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek for they will inherit the land. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the clean of heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are they who, who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they insult you and persecute you and utter every kind of evil against you falsely because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward will be great in heaven. Thus they persecuted the prophets who were before you. That's like one of my favorite verses. That's great. Thank you so much for reading that. Yeah, of course. Thank you. I love it. Rose, it's been a pleasure to have you on the podcast. I want to have you come back again in the future. Yeah, absolutely. That we'll get into amazing. some more stuff. And, yeah, I uh, love these things. <laughs> but this was a good, a good crash course. I really wanted people to, to, um, to see what you were about because you're so fascinating to me. I love seeing what you, you post like, it seems like you post like 30 TikTok videos a day. It's like constantly. No, it's crazy. <laughs> I don't know how you have time to do it all, but, uh, but yeah, it's really neat. So everyone go see that. And, uh, and Rose, I hope you come back and I, it, it was just wonderful talking to you today. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it today. Thanks for coming out. Bye -bye. Yeah, no problem. There you have it. My interview with the religious hippie. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to Quest. Please be sure and rate and review this podcast. This podcast is copyright. Any previously trademarked or copyright content is used by permission. Be sure to visit the official website for the International Association of Metatomics at metatomics.org or find us on social media for other unique content. And make sure to pick up a copy of the book that started a spiritual revolution, Metatomics, The Grand Design, available for sale online and at most major bookstores. Thanks for listening.